Bonds. Fate's variation on the attraction gauge that is not too uncommon in many gacha games. Most gachas have a reward of some kind involving getting your characters to a high bondage, either with extra stories, new interactions, or gaining materials. FGO has that as well, with new voice lines up to Bond 5, ports or apples depending on rarity up to Bond 9, and then the grand reward of a Bond CE, usually a snippet of deep lore regarding the character, and not so usually a useful overpowered effect. But I don't care about any of that today. It was brought to my attention that not many people realize that not all Bonds are created equally. FGO took a very interesting route when deciding how to implement its first five bond levels, in that they, in a way, actually reflect the servants you are trying to bond with. Where in other games you usually raise them based on either their rarity or a type of item, some characters in FGO straight up just hate you and do not want to be bonded with you. So today, we're going to take a deep look into the goofy world of the first five bond levels. Let's start with some ground rules for all of you so that we're on the same page. Every servant with only one exception has a minimum bond cap of 10,000 bond points. If you're curious what that looks like in terms of difficulty, if you farm the max ember node with no bond CE, it's 915 bond per node. So running the ember node 12 times will max bond one of these units which is incredibly easy and will give you enough embers to level most servants. In general, we can assume that any servant whose bond cap is this low either really likes us, is easy to get along with, or might be trying to manipulate us. On the opposite side of the spectrum is the maximum of 50,000. These are the units that require you to really put your effort in and show that you're really dedicated to them and still they might just not like you. The ones who fall into this grouping are, as mentioned, the ones that just hate you, the ones with trust issues, and the ones who are just complicated to get along with. In general, there is a set pattern on the bond growth curve. Some are completely linear, requiring the exact same amount each time. Some require a strong start and then a strong finish. Some require a crazy strong start and then ease up after. And some gradually reduce the amount required after the initial bond. These aren't all of the patterns, but just the primary ones that I seem to find. Now, the actual servants that are tied to these is what is fascinating. Let's start with the one outlier I mentioned earlier, MASH. MASH's first five bonds are all at increments of 1000 and are earned through the story, so she's more or less exempt from this list. We love the Kohai and she loves us back and that's all that really matters. But let's start off with a unit that we can assume is going to like us off the bat, Matahari. Cheerful, positive, has massive, enormous big sister energy. Easy going as well. Her bond caps at 10,000 and has a gradual increase of 500 points per bond. It's completely linear and low, befitting of her cheerful, sunny demeanor. Other servants that we know for a fact really like us would be the infamous Stalker Trio, consisting of Kiyohime, Serenity, and Raiko. Kiyohime is relatively easy to get along with, with a bond cap at 15,000, and a linear bond curve of an increase of 7,500. Simple and sweet, just like her. Serenity, on the other hand, seems to be a little bit more difficult to get along with. She has a max cap of 27,500, with the initial push from Bond 1 to 2 being the highest hurdle. After this, it gradually decreases the amount required, with the final push to Bond 5 only being a paltry 2,500 Bond. Lore-wise, this makes sense for her as a character, being terrified of hurting us and so keeping us at an arm's length, until she realizes that we won't die by touching her, after which she warms up to us very quickly. Then there's Raiko, the one to be Mama. Hers is weird, befitting a Berserker. The initial push from Bond 1 to Bond 2 is a whopping 20,000 Bond points, meaning Mama doesn't trust easily. But then after that, up to Bond 4, it's simply 2,500 per Bond, so she warms up to the idea very fast when she realizes that we're not going to run away. Then finally, the hurdle from 4 to 5 is 10,500 points with a max of 40,000. This to me reads like an internal conflict with herself. She wants to like us and treat us as her child, but she is also aware enough for a Berserker to know that she herself is very dangerous and has within her a demon that may or may not break out and kill us. So once she sees both our resolve and her own determination, she lets us in. For two of these characters, they have summer forms as well, which canonically are forms from after they have reached at least Bond 5 and spent a considerable amount of time in Chaldea. In the case of Kiyohime, her Bond leveling is identical to her Berserker selves, remaining relatively easy as she is. Raiko, on the other hand, starts off relatively hard at 8,000, but dramatically decreases the amount needed between Bonds, all the way down to the low 2,500 for Bond 5. In other words, she's willing to set aside her prefectural duties in order to let us be closer. Alright, so we can more or less figure out that that group was going to be on the side of like pretty easily, so sticking with trios, let's look at another popular 
popular group of servants, the Tam Lin. Let's start with my personal favorite of the group, Bargist. Bargi is similar to Summer Raiko, in that she starts off on that high hurdle, but then warms up to you relatively quickly. This is likely due to her knightly personality and fierce loyalty to the master, who she wishes to protect down to an instinctual level. However, as she does take time with this process, she is at a max of 27,500. Surprisingly, Balvan Sheath is rather easy to bond with. Despite her prickly exterior and seemingly sadistic tendencies, she has a relatively linear bond period with an identical bond 5 level to Bargist. However, where Bargist starts off difficult, Bob finishes hard, but not in a wild way, just with 10,000 for bond 5. This implies heavily that her constant talk of disliking us in Chaldea and everything else is actually just a front, but we kind of already knew that. Bob, by nature, is actually very sweet and caring, but puts up that front for self-defense. So that final jump to Bond 5 is her putting us up to the test to see if she can act more natural around us. Finally, we have Melusine. As one may expect from a dragon, she's pretty random with her way of thinking and how we bond with her reflects that. She has a Bond 5 cap at the very unusual number of 41,2500. ,000, her Bond jump from 1 to 2 is a steep 15,000, then eases up to 5,000, then 6,250, then 10,000. It seems like Bond 1 to 2 is her test for us to prove how much we are willing to invest into her, as well as her growth period going to serve a new master after Aurora. Being a creature fundamentally different from both humans and Fae makes her a bit of an oddball to get along with, but she seems relatively open-minded about the idea. These girls all have summer variants though, so let's take a look at those as well. Bargies is identical to her saber forms, which makes sense because her personality hasn't changed that much. She will always be the same Bargie. Kite Ku Kerr Priestess, aka Summer Bob, has a very weird one. She requires more bond than her archer self, needing a max of 35,000. She starts out rough, needing 12,000 for bond 2, then eases up to needing only 3,000, then for bond 4 she needs 13,000, and then finally another simple 3,000 to get to bond 5. This is Sundere bonding at its absolute finest, and anybody who's read through Summer 8 knows Bob's experiences in Chaldea have allowed for her to revert back to her normal self, her true normal self, the more happy character who enjoys reading in quiet days but is willing to serve tea and chat with the master for the enjoyment of their company, but the moment that she realizes others that aren't the master may perceive her differently than normal, she becomes a raging inferno boosted by the divine might of Karanos. 10 out of 10, Sundre behavior. Then there's Melusine. She and Matahari have the exact same bond curve, capped at the lowest possible 10,000 and the easiest to level linear curve. Melusine has declared that we are her mate and is acting as such, so we determined how to tame the dragon and the answer was headpats and soy sauce. Let's take a look at another trio before moving on to just individuals. The enemies of humanity, the apostles of the foreign god, Domen, Muramasa, and Rasputin. I'm excluding Koyanskaya from this particular list because we're going to cover her later. Starting with Domen, our longtime enemy, a master schemer, someone who when we finally do kill him we were so done with his shit that we just tell him to die. After being summoned to Chaldea, his bonding is deceptively easy. His bond 5 cap is 15,000 and has a linear growth to it, increasing at increments of 750. Now, we know for a fact that Doman has no love for humans or humanity. It was this lack of love for humanity that led to his downfall. So then why is it so easy? The answer is pretty simple. While he himself could care less whether we live or die, having us as an ally maintains the possibility that he can manipulate us in the future. So his affections here are exclusively artificial and with ill intent. Muramasa's is identical to Bargus. For him though, the reasoning is slightly different. He's an old man. His investments in a new whippersnapper on the block is minimal, but much like old people, if you play into their senses and treat them with respect, you can get close to them. This is how Muramasa functions. We leave him to do his work, show some interest in it, spend some time while respecting his boundaries, and before you know it, boom, you got a cool sword. And then there is Rasputin. He has a totally linear curve, requiring 6,250 bond per level, capping at 27,500. Rasputin slash key rate is a weird one for sure. It's hard to tell what he's thinking, and you know his motives are relatively impure. Being as mysterious as he is, a completely gradual getting to know period like that is the only real way to handle it. Almost as though he had planned it all from the start. But what of Koyanskaya and her other side? Koyanskaya. Koyan of Light is hard to bond with. She keeps you at an arm's length the entire time and needs the full 50,000 bond. The jump from bond 1 to 2 is an enormous 24,000 followed by an additional 15,000 to get to bond 3. She does not like us and is making that abundantly clear. However, for bond 4 to 5, she needs a very light 2,500 for each. My best guess is that at this point she realizes that we are a paying customer, and as such is willing to try and butter us up so that we keep spending our hard-earned QP on her. And you know what? 
She was right. How many of you out there have triple tend Koyan of Light? You fell right into her trap. Do you honestly think that all that QP was being used to afford the level up machine's cost to run? Hell no, she pocketed all that for sure. Koyan of Dark, on the other hand, is a bit more complicated. Much like her other self, she doesn't like you at all at the start, requiring a fairly large 20,000 bond cap for just bond 2. After this, however, she mellows out considerably, requiring just 2,500 for both Bond 3 and Bond 4. Then, as the last push to Bond 5, she needs the moderately sized 10,000 Bond points, making her cap at 40,000. Unlike her more entrepreneurial side, Koyan Dark is actually less corrupted. Her reasoning for disliking us is fairly justifiable, given how she views humans as a whole and how we attempted to kill her on multiple occasions. However, her view of us as an animal, rather than as an individual, is what allows her to soften up on us. Plus, that final push of 10k feels very much like a coming to terms time for her, probably not accepting us, but certainly no longer feeling just disdain from our presence. The last group that I wanted to look into for this video is the Beasts of Humanity that we have summoned to Caldea. Technically speaking, we've only done this once, but I'm counting all the ones that we have snagged in different classes as well. These are Session Kiara, Kama, Tiamat, and Draco. I'm going to exclude Lady Avalon from this particular list until FGO uses that aspect of her. Starting with the horny nun herself in her alter ego form, she shares an identical bond leveling lineup to Coin of Light, starting off with 24,000 to 15,000, then 2,500 twice. Now, where I believe that Koyan is the one keeping us at arm's length for the beginning of our bond with her, I think the reverse is true for Kiara. Remember, we know for a fact that in a divergent timeline, she killed us, and has every intention in the world to get back to that timeline if possible. She is the final girl boss who has mastered the arts of gaslighting and gatekeeping to the point where she eventually wears us down and we accept her onto the team. We know what she is capable of and willing to do, but sometimes you gotta start rolling with the gaslighting. As one might expect, her summer form is easier to get along with because we've already spent a considerable amount of time with her and know her games. She has an M-shaped growth curve, needing 12,000 for Bond 2, then 3,000, then 13,000, then finally another 3,000, capping it at a total of 35,000. This growth curve of bursts of stubbornness is very fitting for this particular Kiara, as she is acting much closer to her more childish version of herself. In a way, this can be viewed as her just fighting internally with herself between being a master seductress, a good servant, and whatever the hell she thinks a magical girl is. Kama joins these two in the exact same boat of bond requirements, needing 24,000, then 15,000, then 2,500 twice. Once again, this is for a completely different reason than the other two. See, where Kiara can be viewed as the final girl boss, Kama is the final girl failure. While she is, in essence, a master of manipulation and control over emotions, she's also incredibly easy. The depravity that she sows onto others and attempts to sow onto us completely backfires and she herself falls hard into the love category. Despite everything that she says and the mask that she wears, if you compliment her enough, she'll fall for you. If you think I'm reading too many dojins or am delusional, then look no further than her summer form's bond requirements. The demon king of depravity, hellbent on corrupting the master of Chaldea and eventually all of humanity, has the lowest possible bond requirements of 10,000 in the exact same bond curve as Matahari and Summer Melusine, two characters head over heels in love with Gudako. This isn't even speculative given the events of Summer 6, it's more or less confirmed how she feels, so enjoy knowing that the little nugget loves you. But what about Mama? Does your mother love you? Of course she does. Tiamat has an incredibly straightforward bond curve, incrementally increasing by an additional 1,000 for each level. She needs 2,000 for bond 1, 3,000 for bond 2, 4,000 for bond 3, 5,000 for bond 4, and then 6,000 for bond 5, with a max cap of 20,000 in total. Straightforward and simple affection, but still requiring slightly more than those who are easy to get along with. Is this because it's a different type of affection than romantic affection, or does she still hold within her a slight twinge of frustration at being beaten back in the Babylonian singularity? Probably the former, because we know that she actually didn't mind being defeated this time around, because she could see our plans for the world and accepted that we had moved past the need for her. In hindsight, maybe she's a little bit salty about that instead. Our final unit, the most recent beast character, as well as the only summonable beast class unit, Sodom's Beast Draco. The harbinger of the end and a symbol of the Antichrist, Christ, she likes you more than Avisbron does. Yes, the little tempura has a surprisingly low bond 5 cap of 35,000, sharing a growth curve with Summer Kiara, the Sundere curve if you will. 
Despite her title and how she acts with a seemingly cold demeanor, Draco doesn't actually seem to have any real animosity towards us the Master. She treats us coldly and possibly even sees us as a tool to get what she wants, but at her core she's still Nero, the Emperor who, at least in Fate's interpretation of them, just wants to be admired, praised, and to be with someone. Specifically stated in her own Bond lines for her grown form, she's a Mary sword, so having the internal conflict between being a beast and making Mary seems to be the source of her bonding struggles. I, for one, accept our heretical overlord with open arms. So that was a glimpse into some of the weird bond levels. Now, given that there are over 300 servants, almost 400 now, naturally I couldn't get into all of them. So, you tell me about your favorite servants bond requirements and why you think that they are the way that they are. Of course, nothing I have said here is definitively proven, so hell, make up your own reasonings. Thanks for watching, by the way. If you enjoyed this and want to see more stuff like it, how about dropping a like and subbing? Check out my other stuff over on my Discord, Twitch, and Twitter. But for now, guys, keep your chin up. Peace.